Today we continue our Abundant Living Fall Sermon Series. In John 10, 10, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. In that same gospel, we're told that from Jesus' grace, from Jesus' fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. That fullness of grace, that abundance of life is imaged in the Bible as a vineyard. Last week, we discovered the breadth of that vineyard imagery in scripture that God's plans for our lives are to bear abundant and eternal fruit that glorifies God, and that there are four levels of fruitfulness. No fruit, some fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. We learn from author Bruce Wilkinson in his book, Secrets of the Vine, how Christians worldwide rate their level of fruitfulness. The answers he received are consistent. Nearly half of all Christians bear little or no fruit. Yet God passionately desires each of us to move up to the next level of fruitfulness. Today we're going to discover how God's discipline and training of us branches helps us move from no fruit to some fruit. Let's continue to walk about this vineyard, shall we? Please turn to John chapter 15, verse 2. John 15, verse 2. What does Jesus say that God does with branches that bear no fruit? Takes away other translations, cuts them off, prunes, removes. Maybe what we're picturing is what we see here, some withered, desiccated, disconnected, and cut off branches. In fact, when we check multiple translations of this verse, they each have the sense of cut off or take away. A pretty grim picture of unfruitfulness. But when we look closer at this verse, we begin to wonder if the picture in our minds is mistaken. After all, Jesus says, God removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Rather than focusing on just the removal and cutting away, why not look at these two key words, in me. Paul speaks repeatedly of believers being in Christ, and that seems to be the point here too. Jesus is saying that it's possible to be in him, yet bearing no fruit. We can be in Christ, but not fulfilling our fruitful destiny. So what happens to those unfruitful branches? To answer that question, we're going to need to dig a little deeper, to go back to the original Greek of the New Testament. The word that most Bibles translate as remove or cut away is iro, pronounced like Cairo without the C. When we look up the meaning of iro, we discover that remove or cut off isn't the usual meaning at all. Let's look at how this word is used elsewhere in the New Testament. After the feeding of the 5,000, the disciples iro the 12 baskets of leftovers. As Jesus stumbles on his way to Golgotha, the Romans compel Simon of Cyrene to iro the cross. Jesus says to iro his yoke upon us. To translate iro as remove or cut off in any of these instances just doesn't work. The usual meaning of iro is this, to raise up from the ground. What if we translated John 15 too with this new understanding of iro? God raises up every branch in me that bears no fruit. It gives a whole new twist to these parting words of Jesus, which we hear in the following verse, you have already been cleansed. Now there is a connection between being raised up and cleansed. But in order to discover it, we're going to have to go out into the vineyard. Vine growers know that new grape branches have a natural tendency to sprawl out and grow on the ground. 
if left to themselves, branches will just run everywhere on the dirt. When branches do grow along the ground, the leaves get coated in dust. When it rains, they can get muddy and mildewed, and the branch can become sick and useless. Taking the usual translation of John 15 too, we think that when a branch gets dusty and muddy, the vine grower comes with a knife to cut it off and remove it. But that's not what great growers do, because the branch is much too valuable to cut off and throw away. The branch has too much value to be removed just because it's dusty and muddy. I want us to picture Jesus kneeling by a muddy branch there in the vineyard with his disciples that evening on his way to Golgotha. They all know the value of branches, even muddy ones, and Jesus says to them, My father, the vine grower, lifts up every branch in me that bears no fruit and cleanses them. And then Jesus lifts up a muddy vine and washes it in a bucket of water. A bucket of water, much like Jesus had just used to wash the feet of his disciples. A bucket of water over which Peter had protested, saying, You will never wash my feet. And Jesus replied, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. And Peter exclaimed, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and head. Jesus wanted to impart to them a lesson they'd never forget, a lesson that's been passed on to us. For they knew the practice of grape growers was to go through a vineyard, to seek out the sprawling and muddy vines and lift them up and wash them off in a bucket of water. Vine growers lift them and cleanse them because they're too valuable to cut off and throw away. The lesson for us is that sin is like the dirt that covers grape leaves, and air and light can't get in. Left to ourselves, we'd sprawl all over the ground and get mildewed and sick. Left to ourselves, we'd never be lifted up and cleansed. Left to ourselves, we'd never produce the fruit that God intends for us. But the vine grower has big, juicy plans for us not to be cut off, but to have a share with Jesus, the true vine. The vine grower knows that although we may be muddy, in the waters of baptism, we are lifted up and cleansed. Why? Because we're so valuable to the vine grower. Let's say we've now been lifted up from the mud of our sins and cleansed in the waters of baptism. We know the vine grower wants us to bear fruit because that's what we were designed to do. It's our reason for existence, our purpose in life. But for some reason, we're not bearing fruit. Maybe we were baptized as infants or young adults or even later in life, but looking back over the intervening years, we feel our time has been fruitless. We wonder what's going on. If our life has been fruitless, the vine grower intervenes with discipline. This, according to Wilkinson, is the first secret of the vine. Now, when we hear the word discipline, we probably get all kinds of negative reactions. Some of them are justified, others are not. Let's looking, look at the meaning of discipline. Discipline is training meant to change behavior, like the discipline of walking or jogging or exercise. Now, we may not like the discipline of exercise, unless we're small children. <laughs> but we all know we need it. A second meaning for discipline is punishment intended to correct, as in you'll be disciplined for your disobedience. The second meaning is not as innocuous as the first, but all of us have received it as children. Before we start getting all bent out of shape about discipline, we need to remember its Latin origins. It comes from discipulos, or disciple. 
there is a direct connection between being a disciple and being disciplined. In fact, the key to moving from no fruit to some fruit is God's discipline. How did Jesus put it in John 15, 8? My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciple. Jesus says there's an intimate connection between bearing fruit and being a disciplined disciple. For it's not enough for the vine grower to simply lift us up and cleanse us in order to bear fruit. Branches, as we can see from the picture, have to be wrapped or tied around the trellis in order for them to thrive. This is known as training the vine as the vine grower desires. Training a vine and disciplining a vine are synonymous. Discipline's what provides the framework, the trellis, for our branches to grow. Without discipline, we cannot produce fruit. Branches have to be trained to grow on a trellis, disciplined in order for them to be directed in growth. Our natural tendency is to sprawl in every direction along the ground and lead fruitless lives. The only thing that will bring us to fruitfulness is God's discipline, direction, and training. We are infinitely valuable to God, even as muddy branches. We may be accustomed to the mud, growing in every direction, but the vine grower loves us so much that he lifts us up, cleanses us, and then disciplines us. Now, discipline is painful because it wrenches us from our sprawling, directionless, and fruitless lives. But in order for us to produce fruit, God must apply it. God's discipline starts when there's a major sin problem in our lives that's blighting our leaves. Discipline doesn't feel good to us branches because we like the mud. Discipline doesn't feel good to the vine grower either because it hurts God when we hurt. But God loves us enough to discipline us so that we can be disciples who bear fruit. God's discipline lifts us up from the mud, which is painful, and straightens out our directionless lives along the trellis. Discipline is God's way of helping us bear fruit. Our reading from Hebrews will help us better understand God's discipline. Please turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4 to 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4 to 11. Let's key in on verses 5 to 6, which say, My child, do not regard lightly the chastening of the Lord, or lose heart when you are rebuked by him. For the Lord chastens those whom he loves and scourges every child whom he accepts. From these two verses, we discover some principles of God's discipline. God is a source of the discipline. God disciplines all believers, and God always acts out of love. Look at Hebrews 12.10. What does it say? Disciplines for a short time and disciplines us for our good. In Hebrews 12, 8, we hear these words. If you do not have that discipline, then you are illegitimate and not God's children. Discipline is just one aspect of God's relationship with us. When our parents disciplined us as a child, they didn't stop caring for us stop talking to us or stop wanting our love in return. If God is dealing firmly with us in discipline, then we can be certain of God's love. In fact, it's only if we've never received discipline that we should be worried because as 12.8 says, if you haven't received discipline, then you're illegitimate and not God's children. Be thankful for God's discipline. It's a sign of God's love and that we're a child of God. The good news in all this is that 
that discipline last only as long as we hold on to the mud. We may be wondering to ourselves, am I being disciplined right now? If so, what are the signs? Actually, there are two questions that help illuminate our relationship to God. Number one, looking back over our life with God. Is there a sinful behavior that we once struggled with that's no longer there? Number two, are there thoughts, attitudes, or habits that once dominated our lives but now don't? If we can answer yes to either of those questions, we're moving forward and upward with God. If we can't, our basket is probably empty, and we're being disciplined, trained by God to become fruitful. It is helpful to know what degree of discipline God is using to get our attention. God uses progressive interventions to turn up the heat by degrees in order to catch our eye. Look back at Hebrews 12, verses 5 to 6. We'll see that chastening, rebuke, and scourges are highlighted. According to Wilkinson, each of these represents a different level of discipline applied by God. We'll see that the first and lowest level of discipline is rebuke. Hebrews 12, 5 says, My child, do not lose heart when you are rebuked. What is a rebuke? It's a verbal warning coming through our conscience, another person, a Bible, a sermon, or the Holy Spirit. It's the gentlest of gestures, kind of like hearing our mom saying our first and middle name. When we heard our middle name, we knew it was time to straighten up and fly right. Because if she got to our last name, we were in big trouble. God does the same thing, warning us that the consequences of our continued actions could be catastrophic. God uses a multitude of options to get us back to our senses. This is the first degree of discipline. And with ears attuned, we quickly make a course correction. But maybe our ears are plugged, and we don't hear so good anymore when God calls us. If so, God turns up the degree of discipline. Degree number two is chastens. Hebrews 12.5 says, My child, do not regard lightly the chastening of the Lord. What is chastening? Chastening is emotional frustration or anxiety. What once brought joy now doesn't. We're critical of Christian friends, and we have a lethargic relationship with God. Maybe we feel on the outs with God, and the Bible feels like a lead weight. If any of these symptoms sound familiar, then we shouldn't redouble our efforts in prayer or Bible reading or going to church, but rather look for some ongoing and muddy sin in our life that hasn't been forgiven. This is the second degree of discipline, and with hearts attuned, we can quickly make a course correction. But maybe our hearts are hardened. So God turns up the degree of discipline. Discipline number three is scourges. Hebrews 12, 6 says, For the Lord scourges every child whom he accepts. What is scourging? Scourging is what the Roman soldiers did to Jesus prior to his crucifixion. Scourging is excruciating pain. All of us have felt that level of pain as God attempts to train and discipline our waywardness. Every child whom God accepts, all believers have been scourged by God because sometimes that's what it takes for us to hear God. C.S. Lewis once said, God whispers through pleasure, but shouts through pain. God loves us so much and so passionately wants us to fulfill our fruitful destinies that God will take whatever measures are necessary to bring us back to our senses, even scourging. 
Yet God has some ground rules when it comes to scourging because it's so personal and easily misunderstood. First of all, God never hurts an innocent person to indirectly discipline a sinning person. Secondly, God never disciplines us from meanness, impatience, or wrath. Thirdly, God always, opportuni- always offers opportunities for us to respond and repent so that we can have a change of heart, mind, attitudes, thoughts, and actions. Maybe we're undergoing discipline today. Maybe we're feeling rebuked, chastened, even scourged. If so, take heart. Because God wants us to be out of this need for discipline even more than we do. God makes some promises beyond the pain. Look what Hebrews 12, 11 says. Discipline always seems painful rather than pleasant at the time, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. When discipline and training bring us to repentance, of turning away from our muddy sins and embracing our fruitful future with God, it has done its job. When we respond to God's discipline, when our wayward branches have been trained on the trellis, although it's painful at the time, it helps us bear fruit for the future. Discipline is time-limited by design to train no fruit branches to bear some fruit with hopes and plans for more fruit and much fruit in the future. We give thanks for the vine grower's love for us, muddy branches, lifting us up and cleansing us, training and disciplining and discipling us to bear fruit for the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're ready to bear fruit for God's kingdom among these branches, we'd welcome you forward as we sing Seed Scattered and Sown. Please stand as you're able.